We soon discover what Anne Hawkes expressed when she first penned these words in 1872. We really do need Jesus. There is no gadget that can substitute for God. There is no technology that can provide the communion with God. Okay, you. good afternoon, everyone. So this is the, the second day of the three-day East of Eden program. And before we begin, why don't we have a quick word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for life. Thank you, Father, that we're here. We're worshiping on your day. And although the subject is heavy, we know ultimately uh, that you care for us and that one day you will restore those who we lost and in this world those we will lose. Be with us now. Be with the speaker. Give him the, the words, the message. Uh, we pray he delivers them with compassion. And Lord, we, 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 we are just hoping that somehow many of us can be healed by this experience this weekend. Be with us, I pray, and be with the program. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, we had a, uh, the first session was last night, and there was some audio challenges with the stream. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to repair that and then upload a better stream with much stronger audio. So some of us were here last night. The last night's program was excellent. Um, uh, although there were some audio challenges that we uh, learned about uh, throughout the evening. So we're going to see what we can do to improve the quality of the audio signal and then re-upload it and then we can uh, make that uh, program available uh, to you as well. Okay, so <clears throat> before we begin, you know, it's always uh, good to get to know the speaker a little bit more, find out uh, about his where beginnings, about his life, about uh, where he came from. Uh, he's got an accent. You know, I'm curious to know uh, where that accent comes from. Uh, so, so without further ado, uh, join us here, and I'll just ask a few questions. Nothing hard. <laughs> Okay, you're not going to be graded. I know you're a professor, you know, uh, so I won't uh, decide to take revenge on you today, you know, for my. So, <coughs> question. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Again, uh, this is Dr. Roy Gaton. Is that right? Yes. Gaton? Okay. Where are you from? All right. Uh, my parents are originally from the Dominican Republic. Mm. Sounds like, you know, let, let's fix your audio. I think your audio signal oh, yeah. is not coming clearly. One second. Let's fix the. All right. So I'll repeat. Ah, Thank there you. There we go. There we go. Okay. Okay. Start. Rewind. Start All right. Over. So again, uh, my parents are originally from the Dominican Republic, huh. and I was born in Puerto Rico. Hmm. And when I was 12 years old, we moved to the beautiful state of Michigan. Oh. And... Um, my father uh, pastored here uh, in the Grand Rapids, Holland, and Berrien Springs. Huh. Yes. Okay, okay. And then, uh, okay, you came here at 12, so uh, you went to high school somewhere. Yes, I went to high school in Grand Rapids at that time, Grand Rapids Junior Academy, mm -hmm. um, Holland um, Junior Academy, and um, I graduated high school from Andrews Academy. Ah, yes. okay. And then, uh, and then I went to um, college at Andrews University, okay. um, and then uh, for graduate school, I went to um, Andrews University Theological Seminary. Hmm. 
mm. the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary. Okay, and that's where you got your MDiv, I think. You and the, and then after that, I got my MDiv mm -hmm. at Andrews University Theological Seminary, yes. And um, mm. from there, do you want me to continue? No, absolutely, continue. All right, so uh, <laughs> after uh, obtaining my, my uh, um, Master's of Divinity, we moved to Orlando, Florida. And in Orlando, Florida, I got uh, my, or I completed my residency okay. in clinical pastoral education uh, for chaplaincy. I did my, my, inter my uh, internship uh, in South Bend, Indiana, and, and then uh, I went to Orlando where I did my residency. Ah. Uh, from there, we moved to the West Coast, hmm. and I was director of uh, chaplaincy at Glendale Adventist Medical Center and after completing my doctoral degree at Claremont School of Theology in Claremont, California, I taught at Loma Linda University at the School of Religion hmm. and I also had a small practice as well hmm. uh, of counseling and it was during that time hmm. that while I was director of uh, chaplaincy in Glendale and teaching at Loma Linda that I also served as a chaplain for the Los Angeles Dodgers, a chaplain for the Glendale Police Department, and chaplain for the LAPD, the Los Angeles Police Department. Interesting. Yes. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. We were there for six years. Six years. And then uh, in 2002, we moved to Hawaii, and we served as director of um, pastoral care, mm -hmm. chaplaincy at the Adventist Hospital in Hawaii, mm. in Kailua, Hawaii. And, um, and then served as a family ministries director for the Hawaii Conference as well. See, I'm trying to do two things at the same time. <laughs> you, you noticed that already, right? <laughs> and so we were there for five years until 2007. Okay. And then in 2007, we moved to Miami, Florida. And I served as director of pastoral care at Baptist, um, uh, Baptist Health South Florida. Huh. And the last seven years, um, while there, I served as pastor of New Community Seventh-day Adventist Church. And, um, and it was in 2018 okay. that we okay. moved here, back to Michigan. You see, going back, coming back yes, home full circle and serving now as professor of pastoral care and counseling hmm. at Andrews University at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary and director for, um, uh, uh, for counseling services at the seminary. Ah, okay. Yeah. Now, a couple of different kinds of questions. Uh, if you could pick one place ah, in the world. That's hard. Uh, <laughs> to live. That's hard. Where would that be? Well, um, um, Berrien Springs, Michigan. Oh. <laughs> Smart answer. You know, in all of this, my parents retired here. So oh, really? if I were to call one place home, mm -hmm. it would be Michigan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. Uh, next, uh, uh, favorite food? You know, believe it or not, uh, I love Italian food. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like my favorite food. But the food that I ate here today in <laughs> Potluck. It's my favorite Potluck church food. <laughs> and so that is my favorite food. Good, good answer. Good answer, is, good answer. And, and you know, I'm very picky. You know, I am very, very picky. Ask my wife. I am very picky with food. But I love the food that I ate here today. Mm. Mm. Very, very yeah. good, very good, very good, very good. Okay, uh, favorite car. Favorite car? Favorite car? I love Dodge. Really? I love Dodge. No sports car. No, 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 no. I love Dodge. And so we have had for the last 20 years, 21 years, mm. we have had a Dodge Durango. Huh. And so that is kind of like our favorite car. <laughs> okay. Uh, favorite land yeah. creature? Land creature. Um, land creature? Yeah, land creature. You know, what is my name again? What is my last name? Gaton. Gaton. So what does, 
Does any of you know what gatón means in Spanish? Big cat. Big cat. <laughs> so big cat. So you guessed it. Uh. Cats. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, favorite bird. Favorite bird? Condor. 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 What, why? 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 They. You know they're not they're not nice to watch. I mean, but they are majestic. Yeah. And they fly high. Yeah. And I do. I love poems, mm -hmm. and I recite a poem that is called the Condor. Oh. And um, and by the way, that poem it, it's not about the condor. It's about a snail. And that poem is about how a, a condor a, a condor challenges a snail to go up the Andes. Uh -huh. And the, the condor, you know, lift up its long wings hmm. and goes up the Andes. And, and, and for many, many months, hmm. you know, does not even think about the snail. Hmm. But the snail, you know, slowly, painfully, but sure, goes up the Andes. And one day, without even thinking about it or s noticing it, the condor just looks and the snail is there. Interesting. And so it's not about strength and it's not, it's not about power. Mm -hmm. It's about courage. Mm. It's about perseverance but all of us all of us will make it mm. yeah. ladies and gentlemen dr. Roy Gaton good afternoon once again friends brothers and sisters it is once again a pleasure and a privilege for me to be able to be here with you once again and be able to share with one another, to dialogue with one another um, in the context of grief, in the context of this afternoon, which is going to be a little different. For this afternoon, we are also going to talk about peace. So before we get started, I want to once again invite the presence of our Lord Invite the presence of God. And so let's borrow our heads and let's have prayer together and let's speak to our God. Our gracious and heavenly Father, as we come together, we ask that you will be with us. Oh God, we have felt your presence. We have heard your message last night, this morning, and so once again we have come once again, we have come, Father, with open hearts, with open minds. And so in the midst of our story, we ask that you will once again speak to us. Be with us. Be with us, each and every one of us. Be with each family that is represented here as well, wherever they might be. It is our prayer now in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start with a story. I made reference in our message this morning, found in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 12.
is a story, of course, of Peter's deliverance from prison. Acts chapter 12. Now, about the time when Herod, the king stretched out his hand to harass those in the church, he then killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw that it pleases the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. Now, during the days of unleavened bread, when he arrested Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers. Now, this is for one prisoner. It was 16 soldiers. And he was intended to kill him after the Passover. Peter was then therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to him or by, or by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, bring him out that same night, with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were kept in prison. Now behold, verse 7, behold an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up. Arise quickly, and at the same time, the chain fell off his hands. And when the angel said to him, grit yourself and tie your sandals, and so he did. And so Peter put on his garment and followed him. So he went out and followed him and did so, not knowing what was done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. And so when there was past the first door and the second guard and the second door, they came to the iron gate that led to the city, which opened by its own accord. And they went out and went down by one street, and immediately the angel left him. May God bless his word. Now with Hollywood was to be making a movie out of this, you can only imagine what was being, you know, accentuated by the spectacular cinematography of Hollywood. I mean, you can only imagine the dungeon dark, cold, where Peter was being held. After all, the emphasis would have been, of course, in the spectacular deliverance of Peter. You can imagine 16 armed guards, Roman soldiers, centurions guarding but one prisoner. And all of a sudden, right, an angel appears. And you can imagine Hollywood presenting this angel, right? An angel appearing and touching Peter and telling him to get up. And the chains, all of a sudden, just dropping out of his hands and arms and feet. Peter getting up and the angels then just dropping like flies as if they were dead. And then Peter getting up following the angel and one door, iron gate, opening one after the other. Yet, the point of the story was not the spectacular, miraculous deliverance from prison. What was the point of the story again? What was Peter doing? Sleeping. To stand in trust when the heat is on. 
to stand in trust when the heat is on. You know, I've been speaking on trauma and death and grief for a long time. And when these events or series of events that causes a lot of stress. Of course, these events that are marked by horror, trauma, helplessness, injury many times, or death again, further responses to trauma, grief that may include feelings of fear, feelings of hopelessness, anxiety, panic, grief, depression, suicidal ideations, physical and behavioral responses, nausea, dizziness, and changes in loss of appetite, sleep, as well as withdrawal from daily activities, isolation, changing patterns of sleep and Eating. Often, counseling is called, which is oftentimes what I am called to teach, to be able to look for practices in using concepts that can be provided to help and assist in helping people deal with these things. After all, that's why I've been invited here today. Yet what I would like to somehow share this afternoon is not so much, you know, principles that will help after the facts. But what I would probably like to share with you more than anything are preventive treatments that when things Negative things come your way, crisis, tragedy, come your way, can help us deal with them, can help us deal with problems and difficulties and tragedies, death, traumas in our lives. Is that okay? Because oftentimes what happens is that we look for things after the facts. Have you noticed that? You know, many times we look for things, you know, um, we try to analyze things after things happen, but, but I think it's important to look for things after, or not after, but before. I'll tell you where I'm coming from with this. Many times, when problems and difficulties come, the more stress we have, the more negative circumstances we have, the lower our immune system. The weaker we become, the less we sleep. The, the worse we eat, the less we exercise. Isn't it true? When well, it should be different. You know, the more problems we have, the more stress we have, the stronger we need to become. The better we should eat, the better we should sleep, the more peace we should have. And so the first principle that I need to share with you is this. Let's look at who we are. The 
Genesis 1, 26 and 27 is a good place to start. Let us create man in our own image. In our own image, he created man. Man and woman, praise God, he created them. We are created in God's image. In other words, let's look at the circle of life. We are created in God's image. God created us. We are created by God. God is our Father, as we spoke this morning. So let's look at the circle of life. There are, there are certainties about who we are. What does it mean being created in the image of God? Now, we can, we can dialogue together. We can argue. What does it mean to be created by God? Does it mean that, you know, God has two hands? Does it mean that God has a nose, two eyes? I mean, we can argue that. But this is the point that I'm making. There are certain divine attributes. There are certain divine gift that we have from our Father, from our Creator. There are certain divine attributes, and, and we can name many of them. You know, there's love, right? That's a divine attribute that we have from God. We have reasoning. We have communication. These are divine gifts. By the way, there's another one that I never even thought about it, but I learned it yesterday. Food. You know, food is a gift from God. That's part of a divine gift that we have from God. You know, there is patience. There is justice. There is free will. By the way, can you believe this? We were talking about this at our table. You know, there are, th there are certain di of these divine attributes that can you believe it? That God limited himself in his great love. God limited himself in order to give us some of these gifts. You know, let's look at, at, at free will. You know, God limited himself in order to give us free will. I mean, God could say to you, you know what? I love you. I want to be with you forever. You're my son. You know, and God could beg you. God, 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 God could desire you. But ultimately, it's up to you to decide. You know, ultimately, you're the only one that can decide. God is not going to force you. You know? And, and, and justice, another one. You know, God could say, you know, Adam and Eve, you know, you guys messed up. You know, I, in fact, I'm giving you not just the Garden of Eden, man, that's just your home. But I'm giving you the whole planet. Okay? But you know what? That tree, you're not going to eat from it. Okay? But this is your home. Because if you eat from that tree, surely you will die. But you know what? After Adam and Eve ate, you know, you, you know, you guys are cool, you know. You know, we have hang out for a while, you know. I enjoy your company. You know what? Let's forget about it. Forget about it. You know what? Let's start over. God could have said that. I mean, God is God, right? But he didn't. For the wages of sin is what? Death. And that is exactly what he paid. His son for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whomsoever believes in him shall not perish but have what? Everlasting life. God is a God of justice. I mean, God has given us all these divine gifts. These this beautiful parts of his character and personality. Now, here's the thing. This divine gift, this divine attributes, and here's the circle of life. And I'm not talking about the Lion King or anything like that, but this is the circle of life. This divine gift, they transform into human needs. I mean, think about it. Let's look at food, the one that I just shared. It's a gift from God, yet it is a human need, isn't it? You know, love, all of us have the gift of love, yet all of us have the need to love and be loved. All of us have the gift of of reasoning, right? Yet all of us have the need to be understood. All of us have the gift of communication, yet all of us have the need to be understood, right? And to express ourselves. All of us have the gift of justice, yet all of us have the need for justice. All of us have the gift of free will, yet all of us have the need for freedom and liberty. I mean, think about it. All those divine gifts and divine attributes, 
transforming to human needs. And here's the circle of life, how it closes it. God, how simple it is. God is the only one that meets those needs. Yet how, how tragic, how horrible it is that most people, most people, they look everywhere and anywhere to meet those needs, except God. I mean, they look at money. They look at material possessions. They look at drugs. They look at alcohol. They look at unhealthy relationships. I mean, they look at unhealthy everything. And they look at so much other than God to meet those needs. And by the way, God is the only one that can meet those needs. And God has given us resources, emotional resources, spiritual resources, physical resources to meet those needs. Yet people look everywhere to meet those needs. By the way, and as they look everywhere and anywhere to meet those needs, you know, they lose themselves. You know, how many people, by the way, come to my office, okay, uh, um, because they have looked everywhere and anywhere to meet those needs, and they sooner or later find out that they've been looking in the wrong place. You know, how many people come to my office, and for example, you know, they come to my office, and as they look in those places, they realize that they lose themselves. You know, I have met people, for example, CEOs, CFOs, and they come to my office, oh, you know what, Dr. Gaton, you know, I am... Um, I, I, you know, I, I just lost my job. I just recently, I had a CFO of a large corporation. And they lost their job because of the, the, the economy in which we live. And they're like, you know, I have no idea who I am anymore. Why? Because they have based their identity on their job. You know, most people, they base their identity, by the way, on what they do. Have you met people like that? Especially men, you know, they're like, they're like how are you? How are you doing? Nice to, I'm Roy. Oh, 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 night. Oh, uh, what is it you do? You know, people like that. That's the first question they ask. So most people, you know, they, uh, they base their identity on what they do or what they have. Material possessions, not on who they are. So I met many people, for example, who base their identity, you know, on those two things. Except they don't base their identity on, what, on who they are. A child of God, a son of God, a woman of God. By the way, most people also, they base their identity, again, not on who they are. So they, they don't base their identity on a child of God or a, a, a wife or a husband. I have met, I have met many people that they, they don't base their identity on a husband because they live their life, as, not as a husband, but they live their life as a single person. You know what I mean? Or, or they, uh, they don't base their identity as a father or a mother because they live their life as a single person. But that's a different story, you know? And so, so again, that's how it is. So, so uh, we're going to come back to this because part, again, of, uh, of being strong and, again, preventive treatment, it is living your life in the context of, okay, in the context of, Meeting your needs in the context of God and not of the world. You see? Okay. Number one now. Number one. The essence of who we are is love. The essence of who we are is love. Write, this, write them down if you can write them. The essence of who we are is love. My friends... If we are created in God's image, okay, and if God is love, remember, according to 1 John 4, verses 8 and 9, okay, and God is love, and we are created in his image, that means that we're what? It means that we are love. So we need to live our life in the essence of who we are, okay? Now, that's easier said than done because sometimes many people do not live their life in the context of love, okay? Sometimes people live their life in the context of, 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 of hatred. Some people live their life in the context of, 
of their, 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 their natural tendencies. You know, many times I, I, I have met people that they know, for example, that they need to do certain things, but they live their life in the context of natural tendencies. What do I mean by that? You know, you know many times, you know, they know that, you know, that they need to spend time with their kids. But what happens? When they come from home from work, they're tired. And so what is better, to sit in front of a television and, and, and watch TV and, and, and eat, you know, Taco Bell or McDonald's than to go and play with their kids outside? You know? What is it better, to come to church because you know you need to spend time with, with God and learn and be inspired, you know, uh, uh, and spend time with the people that are here, that care for you, that are part of your tribe, that are part of your support system, or, or maybe stay home because you had a hard week and you, didn't want, you want to rest, you know. What, what, what are better? You know, again, the essence of who we are is love. So live your life in the context of love. But here is another point that I'm getting. I, I, I want you to, to think about this. I want you to, and those that are watching as well, you know, do this for me. I want you to think about this. Think about decisions that you have made in your life. Think about this. Decisions that you have made in your life. In fact, if you can close your eyes, close your eyes and think about major decisions that you have made in your life, path that you have taken, okay? You know, decisions that you have made. Decisions that you have made, whether relationship issues, rela relationship decisions that you have made. You know, maybe job decisions, jobs that you have taken or not taken, or, or, or maybe jobs that you have accepted or that you have, maybe jobs that you have applied or not applied. Places that you have moved or not moved. Think about it. Decisions that you have made in your life, major decisions. Okay, you can open your eyes now. Okay, think about this. Those decisions that you have made in your life are have either been made in the context of love. Think about this. Those decisions have either been made in the context of love, okay, or in the context of fear. Yes or no? Those decisions, those major decisions in your life, you have either made those decisions in the context of love or in the context of fear. Yes or no? I mean, a job that you have taken, for example. A job that you have stayed in. Maybe a relationship. M maybe, maybe a relationship that you stayed in or that you left. You have made those decisions either in the context of love or in the context of fear. I have known, my friends, people that have actually stayed in a relationship, not out of love, but out of fear. I, in, in seminars like this, for example, you know, during a break or afterwards, I have had, for example, women that have come to me, and after hearing their stories, I, and, and I'm a counselor, but after hearing their stories, I'm like, you know what? Why are you with him? And I'm like, listening to their stories, and they're like, oh, you know what, Dr. Gaton, you know, uh, you know, you know, yes, you know, he beats me up, but you know, he loves me. Th that's just his personality. Or you know, he comes from a, from a home where, where there's violence. Or you know what, where am I gonna go? You know, I, 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 I'm from Haiti, I'm from Jamaica, I'm from Cuba, you know, I'm from Panama. Where am I gonna go? I have five kids, he's the only one that works. Where am I gonna go? And they stay in their relationship out of love or out of fear? Out of fear, okay? I have known people that have entered marriages because I'm not going to find anybody better. You know, you know, maybe he's the only one that is going to love me or maybe, you know, 
you know, maybe he's the only one that will love me. You know, and they go into marriages. Just recently, there was a celebrity, a lady that was a singer, and she, 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 was, she, she was in her 40s, and she had an 8-year-old son. And she came to me, and she had been married for two years, and she goes, you know what, I entered this marriage. I knew from the beginning that it was doomed. But you know what, my, 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 my son needed a father figure, and there was nobody else. I know people that have stayed in their jobs, not because they like it or they're passionate, but, you know, I don't think I can do anything better or find anything better. And they have stayed in that job. Or, or because they have fear of applying to a job that they were afraid that they're not going to get. And so I share this with you. So in the future, my friends, as you're going to make a decision in the future, listen, Make that decision in the context of love and not in the context of fear. Okay, love, true love. God, you, and you know what? Then everybody else. But make those decisions in the context of love and not in the context of fear. Okay, number, number two. Number two, connect with your resources. And your resource is God. Your resource is God. You know, you know not, last, week, last night we talked about prayer. You know, again, oftentimes we think about prayer, but we think about prayer many times in the wrong way. Because when we talk about prayer, many times when we talk about prayer is about, you know, asking God for this or asking God for that. But you know what? Prayer is more than asking God for things. Prayer has to do with so much more. You know, the seven dimensions of prayer. Number one, awareness of the holy. You know, when you pray, there's an awareness of the holy. In other words, I'm not praying to this pew. I'm not praying to this television. I'm not praying to this computer. There's an awareness of the holy. So when I pray, there is an awareness that God is present. Okay, when I pray, number two, there is faith. In other words, when I pray, there's faith that God is listening to my prayer. Okay, I know that my prayer goes beyond just that ceiling. Okay, God is listening. Number three, when I pray, there's grace. In other words, when I pray, it's not by my merits, but it's by God's grace. Okay, when I pray, number four, Yes, there's providence. In other words, when I pray, it's okay to ask God for things. Okay? Yes, you know, in, in the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer, by the way, it's full of, of asking God for things. The Lord's Prayer, there are seven petitions in the Lord's Prayer. Okay? So it's okay to ask God for things. You know, number five, when I pray, you know what? There is communion relationship okay when i pray it's okay there's relationship when i pray number six repentance i have repented from my sins and lastly when i pray there is vocation in other words there is identity when i pray in a world where there is there's no identity in a world where people where people are like like the wind you know when i when i pray I know who I am. I know where I come from. I know where I am at. And I know where I'm going. You know, there's identity. There is purpose. There is significance. I know where I come from. I know where I'm going. And I know where I am at. Okay? So, so there is communion with God. All right? Number three. Giving and receiving are the same. You know, we live in a... In a, in a, in a um, and I want to be careful how I say this, but we live in a community that, that, is, that it's always about, in most ways, it's always about giving and giving and giving, you know? So the moment when it's about us, it's hard, you know? It's, I mean, we, we have grown up in, it's about serving, right? It's about serving. But when it's about us, it's, you know, I remember, I remember when I was in seminary, you know, when I read a book that it wasn't about 
you know, my homework or my, I felt guilty. You know, whenever I took a day off as a pastor at the beginning of my ministry, I felt bad, you know. You know, because, you know, I felt that I was cheating. You know, but you know what? I needed that day off. I needed to recharge my batteries. You know, I needed to rest, you know. No wonder God gave us the Sabbath, right? We need to rest. We need to rest, you know. Um, in a world that oftentimes goes at 100 miles per hour, you know, we need to, to stop and recharge our batteries, you know. It, it's, like, it, it's like if we, and all of us, I believe, I believe in the priesthood of all believers. In other words, we're all ministers, right? And so if we are all Ubers that are taking people to the kingdom, you know, if, if we run out of gas... You know, how can we take people to the kingdom, right? <laughs> we can't. And so we need to stop uh, and, and fill our tanks. And, and so, so, you know, it's like God, it's like Jesus, you know, when he said, you know, the greatest commandment, love, love God above everything else and your neighbor, not more than you, but love your neighbor as yourself. And, and so here is the key. You know, in order to love others, you have to love yourself. And in order to care for others, you got to care for yourself. In order to serve others, you have to serve yourself. So you need to find time for yourself. You know, and, 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 and so that's important. And even in ministry, in, in, in ministry, we have to be able to do that, you know. Number four, a and here is the thing about going back to the beginning of my time with you. Um, it is important, and this is part of it, I'm not talking about the whole thing, but it is important to identify and connect or reconnect with your spiritual and emotional resources. And so w w when, I, when I talk about spiritual and emotional resources, what I mean is this. Spiritual and emotional resources is everything and, uh, uh, everything and anything that will help you be yourself, that will inspire you, motivate you, um, fulfill you, makes you, you, you. Um, everything that 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 fulfills you um you know th th there are there are many things that will not only bring you closer to god but that god has provided for you as well to make you strong and to motivate you to continue being yourself which is what god wants you to be okay and so 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 for example you know all those things, and many of us, many of us know. I, I, I'll share a story with you. There was this business professor. Now, one day in his class, or at the beginning of his class, he asked his students, okay, time for a quiz. It was time for a surprise quiz. And so, you know, all the students put everything away. The professor also, in his desk, put everything away. And so, as he put everything away, he proceeded to take a, an empty one-gallon mason jar. Okay, and then he proceeded to take another mason jar that it was full of rocks. And so then he proceeded to place in the empty, empty one-gallon mason jar, he proceeded to place rocks, one after the other, on that empty uh, mason jar. And then he started placing those, ro those rocks until no more rocks would fit inside. And he asked his students, you know, is this jar full? You know, the students, you know, knowing that no more rocks would fit inside, they raised their hands, all of them, and they said no. The professor said, really? Then he proceeded to take another jar full of gravel. And then he started placing the gravel inside the jar until no more gravel would fit inside. And then he asked the same question, is this jar full? You know, by this time, one of the students was on to him, and he said, Professor, 
No. He says, good. Then he proceeded to take a, a, a glass or a jar full of sand. And then he proceeded to start placing the sand inside the jar. So the sand started going between the rocks and the gravel. And then the professor asked, is this jar full? Of course, by this time, the students were on to him, and they raised their hand, and they said, no. The professor said, good. Then he started to take a picture, a picture of water, and he started placing the water inside until the jar was full to the brim. And then he asked, what's the point of this illustration? You know, one of his students, remember, there, was, there were business students, and so one student raised his hand and said, Professor, the point of this illustration is that it doesn't matter how full our schedule seems to be, if you try really, really hard, you can always stuff more things into it. You know, the professor said, well, that's a good answer, but that's not the right answer. You see, the point of this illustration is this. If you don't put the big rocks in first, you can never get them in at all. And so here's the thing, as I bring this illustration to my point. See, we all know what the big rocks are. We all know what those spiritual resources are, what those emotional resources are. You know, it could be prayer, right? It could be church. You know, it could be our spouse. It could be our children. It could be exercise. It could be a hobby. It could be a sport. It could be basketball. It could be baseball. You know, it, it, could, be, um, it could be a relationship. It could be our friends. You know, we all know. It, it might be similar for many of us. It could be different. I remember, you know, when I was in Los Angeles, you guys, you guys heard my story here, a part of it. Um, when I was in Los Angeles, you know, if people would, uh, were to ask me, you know, what, Roy, what are some of your spiritual resources? You know, when I was in Southern California, you know, I would say, you know, um, prayer. Prayer was a spiritual resource for me, what, an important one, of course. And I was praying, yes. I was praying, you know, 10, 20 times a day, 30. But there were days that I wasn't even praying even one time for me. You know, I was praying with patience and clients and people. I wasn't even praying once some days for me, you know. Uh, my wife, my wife was a spiritual resource, you know. i have been married 33 years, you know. I wasn't even spending time with her, you know. My children, they were small at the time. I was, a, I was getting home at 11 o'clock at 9, 12 o'clock. And by the way, then on weekends I was traveling because I was, you know, flying and preaching and going everywhere. And, and, and I exercise, what's the first excuse for exercise? I don't have time, right? By the way, because sometimes food, remember that I mentioned food too here as a gift from God? Food wasn't even in the, in the game because, you know, I wasn't eating breakfast and of course, you know, lunch is sometimes hard when you're having meetings. So I became a fan of, you know, McDonald's french fries. You know. And so that's what happened. What are your spiritual... I was talking the other day with a, a gentleman, and he was telling me, you know, I was asking the same question. What are, what are your spiritual resources? Oh, I love fishing, he said. Oh, nice, you know. Oh, yes, you know, when I go fishing, you know, and I love being alone, you know. And, and when I feel, when I'm alone, I'm closer to God. I'm like, good, you know. So when was the last time you went fishing? Oh, you know what, pastor, you know, I, I haven't been fishing, you know. I haven't been fishing in years. <laughs> oh, why? Oh, you know, my boat is messed up. I don't have money to fix it. I haven't found the time. You know, that's, it's not about identifying your spiritual resources. It's about making them a priority. You see? So that's important. So connecting or reconnecting with your spiritual resources. And by the way, I'll share this, and I, I believe this comes from Advent Health in Florida, but the six best doctors in the world, and there's no money here, sunlight, rest, exercise, diet, self-confidence, and lastly, 
relationships, friends and family. Okay, number five now, number five. Health is inner peace. Health is inner peace. So if health is inner peace, then that means that healing is letting go of fear. So if health is inner peace, healing is letting go of fear. I have been in situations where you would look at a person and you would think by looking at them that they are the most wonderful person in the world, that they have everything that anybody could ever want. And then I have looked at others where you look at them, terminal cancer, and you would think poor, pe poor, poor people, you know, poor person, right? And then the person that you think that have everything that anybody could ever want is miserable. Because here's the thing. Healing, healing comes in many different levels. You see, I have been with people in the hospital who have been, you know, diagnosed with, with stage four cancer, and they're, you know, they're young, and, and you know what? When they come to the hospital, they're angry at everybody. I mean, they're angry at God, they're angry at themselves, they're angry at their family, they're angry at everybody. But I remember as I started talking with them and communicating with them, and then later on, you know, ministering to them, you know, they are, they're changing, and, and then all of a sudden you see them changing, and, and, and you see the healing, you know, and then, and then, yes, they die. But by the time that they die, physically, you have seen how they have healed. You know, and then there are others that, that they are dead inside. So again, healing is inner peace. Remember Peter? Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Healing is inner peace. And so if healing is inner peace, then, th 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 then, then th or health is inner peace, then healing is letting go of fear. Number six, we can let go, and this is easier said than done, I understand. We can let go of the past. Regrets, doubts. We can let go of the past. And we can let go of the future worries and anxieties. How much time does that take? How much time and energy do we consume? We can let go of the past, okay? Regrets. We can let go of the future worries and anxieties. And we can always come back at the present, the here and now. And, and again, how much time do we spend, you know, thinking of the past, regrets, and, and spending so much time, you know, the past is gone, it's not going to come back. We cannot change it. Or how much time do we spend worrying about the future, worries and anxieties? I mean, I can be, today's Sabbath, right? I mean, I can be here with you, I mean, enjoying my time. I have been blessed by all of you, right? And I can be here, and maybe I received, you know, maybe after sundown, let's say, I receive a text, let's say from the, from the dean of the seminary. And I says, Roy, I want to see you. I want to see you Monday morning at, at 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I mean, that, <laughs> what's the first thought that comes into my mind? Uh, what did I do wrong? Isn't it? What did I do wrong? I mean, you know what? My weekend is ruined, by the way. I mean, I'm like here thinking about, you know, what did I do wrong? And I start analyzing and I'm overanalyzing it. And I mean, I start exploring my life and, and I, I start seeing, uh, analyzing everything that I did, evaluating. And then, and then this is a human tendency. Then it starts going the wrong way. You know, it starts, you know, everything is because that's how we are. And then, and then. Anxiety and worries, it's a double-edged sword. Because not only is ruining my weekend, but I don't even know what's going to happen on Monday. You know, and that's how it is. And so, so we can stop worrying about the past, regrets, doubts, 
and we can stop worrying about the future, worries and anxiety, and we can always come back to the present, to the here and now. Okay? The past is not going to come back. The future, by the way, might never come. You know, what we have for sure is the present. This is God's gift right now. This is God's gift. This is what we have. Number seven. And, and this is a toughie. But I can tell you that, that it does help. We can learn to love ourselves and others by forgiving rather than judging. We can learn to love ourselves by forgiving rather than by judging. Now, here it is. I can tell you this. The issue with forgiving, it's important and essential for all of us. Because you see, there is nothing more beneficial to us than forgiving. Forgiving, my friends, is more about us than other people. Okay? Because, because the thing about forgiveness is that it can hurt us a lot more than other people. All right? I, I'm going to use my brother here, but, you know, <laughs> because he's my brother. But let's see, for whatever reason, that Pastor George and I were friends, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, I don't know why, you know, Pastor George doesn't want to be friends with me anymore. You know, and I don't know why, and I'm like, you know, eh, you know, maybe, maybe I perceive that he hurt me. And like, so now, every time that I see him, I'm like, oh, you know, and I hate that guy. And oh, you know, I'm like here, and, you know, and, you know, and, and I, I scringe, you know, and, you know, and it's hurting me. You know, the poor guy might not even remember or might not even care, but it's killing me inside. You know, it's killing me inside, and it's, you know, it's making me sick. You know, but forgiving or by forgive, I'm healed. You see? Uh, and many times, sorry, my brother, but many times, many times, I in the context of counseling, by the way, there are two things that are important to share. Number one is many times, one of the questions that I, that, I, that I ask or I analyze is, you know, is it my issue or is it somebody else's issue? You know, because many times here I am killing myself and the problem is not even mine. You know, it might be somebody else's issue, you know. A a and, and then, of course, you know, the, the, the second thing is, what can I do about it? And so, again, you know, forgiveness is important. Now, I'm going to tell you something else that sometimes we don't want to hear. For here it is. So sometimes we think of the unpardonable sin, right? And so when we think of the unpardonable sin, oftentimes what we think about is, um, you know, rejecting the Holy Spirit. That's what, what oftentimes we think of the unpardonable sin. But there's another unpardonable sin. We don't talk about. There is another. You know, when we read the Lord's Prayer, when we read the Lord's Prayer, by the way, we got it wrong. Because when we read the Lord's Prayer, and when we read the part that says, forgive us, forgive our trespasses, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, you know, we got it wrong. In, in the Greek, it actually says this way, because the King James got it wrong. It says it this way, forgive us our trespasses as we, past tense, as we forgave those who trespass against us. And so here it is. In the Lord's Prayer, in Matthew 6, there is no commentary before 
or after the Lord's Prayer? But one. Okay, there's no commentary in the Lord's Prayer. Before or after, but one. Matthew 6, 13 and 14. You guys want to read it? You guys there? Huh? You guys there? Yes? <laughs> All right. Matthew 14, verse 13 and 14. This is the only commentary, by the way. Matthew 6, 13 and 14. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not, but if you do not forgive Men their trespasses, neither your father forgive your trespasses. <laughs> Talking about an unforgivable sin. By the way, it is also mentioned, the same thing, it is also mentioned in Matthew 11. Same thing. It is the parable, remember, of the king that forgave the debt of that servant. Remember that great debt? And then the servant was walking out and, you know, there was his friend or acquaintance and compared to the other one, he asked to forgive a little debt and the guy didn't forgive it. Same comment is given. The power of forgiveness. The last one. The last one. We feel as we interpret our stories. Do you guys remember the sermon today? We feel as we interpret our story. One story, two different people. You ask the same the one person, the first person, how are you? How you doing? The person says, well, you know, man, I, I messed up. You know, um, this whole pandemic, I lost my job. I got no money, man, to support my family, you know. Got involved in a car accident. Car was totaled. I got no car now. You know, and uh, this whole economy, man. Uh, you know, kids are home from school. They're going to be here. They're going to be driving me crazy. One story, two different people. You ask the same person. So how are you? Man, this, this economy is hard. You know, I lost my job. But, but thank God we're making it, you know. God has been providing. You know, I um, got into an automobile accident. The car was totaled, but thank God I'm alive. I was able to walk out. You know, the, uh, the kids are soon coming home from school, but they're going to drive me crazy, but we're going to have them home. You know, we feel as we interpret our stories. That's a whole life changer right there. How do you feel as you interpret your story? God changes the interpretation of our story. God changes the ending of our story. I told you in the sermon, those of you that were here last night, um, 
that I kind of left you hanging, remember? Because we talked about east of Eden. And so we talked about Genesis 3.21. And Genesis is a short verse, one of the shortest in the Bible. And you could feel the pain in that verse. You could feel the pathos. And in Genesis 3.21, you could feel the changing of the story. And God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothing. I mean, you can feel how the story, for some reason, is changing. I mean, before that, Adam and Eve and God, three friends that were, you know, going, walking together, spending the days together, you know, just three best friends. I mean, these people were just having a direct relationship with God. Something must have happened, right? The Sabbath school lesson is talking about creation. Something must have happened. Because before this, three best friends, God created Adam and Eve to have a personal, intimate relationship. No robots, you know, no puppets, you know, no pets. I mean, these were intimate relationships with powerful, beautiful, strong, independent human beings with God. But something must have happened because, you know, these were people that were actually, you know, Ellen White talked about how they were, they were covered, they were dressed with God's own light, divine light, right? And so what, what, what we have here is God. And so we're going to end the story today where we began. For you see what we have here is the most, the most painful, the most, the most sorrowful, the most, the, the most, the, 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 the most terrible, the darkest moment in the history of the world. Yet the most, yet the most merciful, the most loving, the most hopeful moment in the history of the world. For you see, what we have here is the God of the universe for the first time in the history of the universe, bending down and for the first time killing an animal. In other words, it's the first time in history where there is a killing. It wasn't Adam, it wasn't Eve. It wasn't a mention in the Bible where it says God asked Adam to kill. God didn't ask Adam to make a garment of skin. But it says that God created for Adam and Eve garments of skin and clothing. As if to point to the day as to the plan of redemption when his son for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son his blood sacrificed in the cross of Calvary it took not much that his only son a God a suffering Savior and a crucified God 
to give his blood, another lamb sacrificed in the cross to clothe us with garments of hope and love to give us eternal life. That's the plan of redemption. That is the preventive treatment in the midst of grief. May God bless us. We want to thank Dr. Gatton for another powerful message. Uh, I know I've been blessed, and I'm sure all you have as well. Um, we want to remind you that tomorrow will be our fourth and final uh, uh, seminar um, entitled Mental Health and Healing. It's going to be at 11 a.m., so we ask that you please come for this final meeting. Um, and if you have any friends you want to bring, please bring them for that as well. Um, before we uh, dismiss, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that there are many people in this church who are struggling with grief and sorrow. We ask that we take uh, Dr. Gatton's message that he's brought, us, brought to us today and uh, apply it to our lives and give us comfort and hope. Please um, continue to comfort those who are grieving in this church. Please help us uh, give us safe traveling mercies as we leave this house of worship, and please be with us in this coming week. In your precious name, amen.